Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. This is the first MSQ uh, biology paper 9700 video that I am making and uh, I hope this is helpful to you all and I am uh, very sure that this uh, has some very good questions in it which will be of great help to you in the coming exam. As you can see this is the November 16 paper 13 and this is a one hour exam. And this of course changes for the 2022 syllabus and it'll be one hour and 15 minutes. But till you're taking the exam in 2021, this is for one hour. First question is which structure, which structure is only found, only is, you know, sort of darker. So you uh, to concentrate on that only found in typical eukaryotic cell, animal cell. Eukaryotic animal cells. They didn't say eukaryotes because if they said eukaryotes, then it's animal and plant and fungus and protozoa and protoctista. So eukaryotic animal cell. Now you know cell membrane is present in all prokaryotes and eukaryotes, animal and plant cells. Golgi protein is present in eukaryotic animal and plant cells, and ribosomes are present, of course, in all. So it was only the answer was centriole. The reason being is because this is the only thing which is present. This is only found in typical. So it's not found anywhere else, but it's only found in typical eukaryotic animal cells. Then we go on to question two. Which letter on the logarithmic scale corresponds to the size of a typical prokaryote? So you know the 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 uh, units given is one millimeter, hundred micrometer, ten micrometer, one micrometer, and 100 nanometer, 10 nanometer, and 1 nanometer. So that was very clear to all of you. In the logarithmic scale, it will, of course, can only be B, which is the 1 micrometer. Then coming to question 3, if you look at question 3, it says, which calculation is used to find the actual length of an organelle from an image? So you know this formula. You know this formula is image over magnification over actual length. So you just have to figure this triangle out. So the size of an image of an object compared to and to calculate using the formula M is equal to I over A. So M is equal to image over actual. Now which calculation you use to find the actual length of an organelle from an image? So if you remember this one, you could have easily done that actual length will be image size divided by the magnification. This would be wrong, this would be wrong, and this would be wrong. Which statement is correct? Question four. Prokaryotes and chloroplasts have circular DNA where genes carrying the code for cell walls are located. Now I've crossed out the ones which are wrong and why they are wrong. Then prokaryotes and chloroplasts have 70S ribosomes that are the sites for translation and polypeptide synthesis. Then prokaryotes and mitochondria have an outer membrane and a separate inner folded membrane where ATP synthesis occurs. You know prokaryotes do not have any uh, mitochondria. Then, uh, then the prokaryotes and mitochondria have double-stranded linear DNA. You know prokaryotes do not have linear DNA. Linear DNA is chromosomes, and that's only found in eukaryotes with genes. So the one, what is wrong is I have uh, sort of, you know, uh, outlined it and you can see these outlines that I've done and this is what I have outlined it and I want you all to remember what is the thing which is wrong. So linear DNA. So when you're reading the question, you need to be very careful and understand each part of the question. It's more of a test, I feel, is more of a test of English rather than of biology. Going to question five, the diagram shows a typical animal cell. I have, uh, this was of course not written on it, this is what I've written is I have a cell membrane, cytoplasm, Golgi body, RER, nucleus, ribosome. Now look at what is the question. The question is which features are also found bo in both plant cells and prokaryotic cells? Now one, two, three, four, five, wherever they're present, one you know is the cell membrane. It is present both in plant cells and prokaryote cytoplasm, yes, in both. Golgi body is only and only present in plant cells. RER present only in plant cells. And then five was the nucleus is not present in prokaryotes and ribosomes are present uh, in prokaryotes. So you can see how the answer to this was B. 
which is I've always circled the ones which are correct and this is the way you have to understand and you have to understand why uh, A was wrong, why C was wrong and D was wrong. So because in both plant and prokaryotic cells. So it was only the one and two and six which were present. What was one and two and six? One was cell membrane, two was cytoplasm and six was ribosomes. Why do I disagree with this question? Something which um, the very good students would understand. This ribosome is an ATS ribosome. And the prokaryote has a ribosome which is 70S. So in a way, that's incorrect. Then question six. Then question six, we had uh, a student carried out the Benedict's test on four different concentrations of glucose and then recorded the time taken for the first appearance of a color change, the end point. Time taken for the first appearance of a color change. You see, the more the reducing sugar, the quickly it will have the first color change. Like something has uh, 10 glucose and something has 100 glucose. So the 100 glucose will react with the copper in the Benedict's and will change color immediately, while the 10 will take a little longer for the color change. So the student found it difficult to identify the first appearance of a color change and consistently timed each solution for two seconds after it had appeared. This introduced a source of error into the experiment. Which statements about this error are correct? The effect of the error will be reduced if the student performs three repeats at each concentration of glucose. The error will prevent the student from identifying which solution has the highest concentration of glucose. The error is systematic as the student consistently timed each solution for two seconds after the end point. And the answer to that was D, which is three only. And I've told you why it is three only, because it was a systematic error. And that is why you had to understand that the others were incorrect and this was correct. Now, I would advise you when you're doing this video is to pause on each question, um, pause it, uh, read it first yourself, then listen to my commentary and uh, I'm sure this is going to help you. So please pause on each time, read the question first yourself and then listen to my commentary afterwards and once you've figured out the answer. Or may, maybe you can just do the question beforehand and then go through the commentary quickly so that you know where you went wrong and which question was uh, why I, I'm, after my discussion you can probably gain a little more knowledge onto it. Let me pause here on question seven. Which row is correct for each of the molecules? We had collagen, hemoglobin, and sucrose. Now, of course, the one which is correct is D. Why? Because collagen is a fibrous protein. And uh, hemoglobin is has all four levels of protein structure and at least four types of bond. And uh, sucrose digestion yields glucose and fructose in equal proportions. You know, sucrose is made up of a glucose plus a fructose molecule. So glucose is a hexose, fructose is a hexose as well. And this would break up into glucose and fructose digestion in equal proportions because it's one glucose and one fructose which makes a, a sucrose molecule. Now, as you look at question eight, the diagram shows how the beta glucose units of cellulose are linked to each other. Uh, what is the significance of the fact that OH groups on carbon-2 and adjacent glucose molecules are on opposite sides of the molecule? Now, here you see it. Remember, it is very easy to pick up uh, cellulose because you see this is CH2OH, then this is CH2OH, and then this is CH2O. So, so it flips each time. And of course, this is what is going to give you the clue for it is that you have the CH2OH on. And so the diagram shows the link to each other. What is the significance of the fact that OH groups on carbon-2, carbon-2 is, this is carbon-1, this is carbon-2, so this is the OH. Now in this, of course, we have, this is, uh, in, the, in the other one, what we have to understand, it has flipped. So which one is carbon-1 and carbon-2? You've got to figure that out. So it would be here that you would have carbon-1 and 2. So this is what we're going to be talking about. This will be the OH, this would be the OH, this would be the OH. So we have to talk about the OH groups. And then if you look at this diagram, which I've given you, the 1,4 glycosidic bonds, the cellulose microfibril from plant cell wall and the hydrogen bonds 
So I have explained this to you why this will be the answer will be D. They can form hydrogen bonds with the adjacent OH and CH2OH groups of other cellulose molecules. So that is why the answer is D. And this diagram really explains this to you why this answer was correct and the others were all wrong. Now looking at question nine, uh, it says threonyl valine is a dipeptide. You know, dipeptide means just compared with disaccharide. Sucrose is a disaccharide, so it's made of glucose and fructose. But then it says threonyl valine is a dipeptide, meaning two amino acids, but one peptide bond. Please do not say dipeptide means two peptide bonds. Disaccharide means one glycosidic bond between two glucose molecules, maltose. So threonyl valine is a dipeptide formed from two amino acids, threonine and valine. A peptide bond forms between the carboxyl group of threonine and the amine group of valine. The side chains of the two amino acids are shown. We never expect you to remember the side chain. So they've given you the side chains, which is the R groups for valine, and they've given you the R group for threonine. So we've got to form a dipeptide, which is threonylvalene. Now the answer to A was correct, but you can see why B is wrong. So this is wrong, D is wrong, and C is wrong. So please understand is that they were asking you how this diagram was correct, which one was correct and which one was wrong. So you can see this is wrong here, and then there is this threonine is not in first, it is the other one which is first, and in this, of course, there's again a mistake. So this is how you're going to figure this out, which one is wrong and which one is right. Then coming to the question 10, as you can see, which feature explain why hemoglobin is soluble? All four polypeptides are linked together to form a spherical molecule. I'm sorry, soluble means it has the hydrophilic R group. So that is why the answer was C, is because the hydrophilic R groups are arranged around the outside of the molecule. They didn't ask you the structure of hemoglobin. They didn't say which features uh, tell us about uh, the structure of the hemoglobin as a protein molecule. And then, of course, you could have said uh, all four polypeptide chains are linked to other forms of spherical. Or you could say, why is it called globular? But the B part was also wrong. Each polypeptide chain folds due to inter interactions between hydrophobic R groups. And D was the wrong with the iron-containing heme group of each polypeptide chain is water-soluble. So the reason you've got to understand is you have to understand the question, which feature explains why hemoglobin is soluble? That's because the hydrophilic R groups are on the outside. And let's look at uh, question 11. An investigation will be the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. Rate, rate, rate is always time. Enzyme catalyzed reaction was carried out during this investigation. The concentration of the substrate, concentration is kept higher then the concentration of the enzyme. So say we had 100 amylases, right? But how much substrate did we have? It says the concentration of substrate was kept higher. So this is the substrate. So we had a lot of the substrate was higher than the concentration of the enzyme. During this in investigation, which change in the variables would always, always, remember, it's, it's always, I've, I've circled it. So would always lead to an increase in the rate of reaction, increase in enzyme concentration, increase in pH, increase in temperature. Increase in pH will, of course, maybe even denature the enzyme. Increase in temperature will again denature. It says will always, sometimes, yes, if the temperature is at 10 and the optimum is 37, then 10 to 37, if we increase the temperature, it will increase the rate of enzyme reaction. If say the optimum pH is three and now we are using one pH, of course, if we increase the pH, it will increase the rate of reaction, but it didn't say that. It says during this investigation, which change in the variable would always lead to an increase. And that was one only because in increase in enzyme concentration will always lead to an increase in the rate of reaction. But if you increase the temperature above the optimum, that is going to denature the enzyme. If we increase the pH above the optimum pH, well, then, of course, you're going to denature the enzyme. So please understand the question. When you're reading it, you've got to sort of make a little example, make these diagrams on the paper. You must realize you're allowed to write on this paper. This paper stays here. Only your answer sheet goes to Cambridge. Question 12, the enzyme glucokinase in the liver. 
and hexokinase in the brain both catalyze the phosphorylation of glucose and they have given you the equation glucose plus ATP glucose phosphate plus ADP. The activity of each enzyme was measured at different concentrations of glucose. The graph shows the results. So we've got activity here on the y-axis. Always put some figures on it. Say this is 100. Concentration of glucose. Put some figures on it. Write 50 on one side or 100 on the other side. So concentration of glucose is increasing. And we have glucokinase and that levels off after a certain concentration of glucose. And then we have hexokinase and it levels off after a certain concentration of hexokinase. The activity of each enzyme was measured at different concentration. The graph shows the results. What describes the different activities of the two enzymes? Both enzymes hold glucose and ATP molecules together at the active site. Glucokinase becomes saturated with glucose at a lower concentration of glucose than hexokinase. Glucokinase phosphorylates more molecules of glucose per minute. And the last one was the affinity of hexokinase for glucose is greater. Now, if you look at how would you find out the Km value? Remember, Km value is you have to find out the Vmax. So whatever this is, say this is 100. Then you go half of it, 50. And then you see how, where does it cut the x-axis? This is going to be the concentration of the substrate. Now, on the other situation, what do we have? This is the Vmax. This would be the half, and we would have the Km here. So this would be the Km for glucokinase, and this would be the Km here. This would be the Km for... So half Vmax, see where it... You see, this is the half Vmax, see where it is, and then you read the x-axis. So please revise. In the chapter on um, enzymes, revise Km, and you know what small Km means indicates high affinity. So you had to figure that out, that this was actually checking whether you knew what are Km and Vmax and all that, and the more small Km indicates high affinity. Then coming to question 13, the value Km is the substrate concentration at which the rate of an enzyme catalyzation, half of its maximum rate, Vmax over 2. Initial rate of reaction, substrate concentration, and then they've given you this graph, and this graph explains to you this. Now, look, so let's look at the question. The question says, the Km was measured in the presence of a competitive inhibitor, and in the presence of a non-competitive inhibitor, what could be the value of Km with inhibitor compared to the value of Km with no inhibitor? Now, as you can see, I've given you another diagram, which is a very uh, good diagram showing you the effects of inhibitors on enzyme and how the Km value changes. So the answer to this was C. Please pause this, look at this graph, understand this graph which I have given you on this uh, page and how adding a competitive inhibitor, then adding a non-competitive inhibitor. So here we have a competitive, here we have a non-competitive and here we have uninhibited. So these are the ones which are absolutely essential, which you need to understand for this part of the syllabus. Then question 14, which molecules found in cell surface membranes help the immune system to identify cells? You know, immune system antigens, antigens on the surface, immune system to identify cells. So of course we all know that is that it is glycolipids and glycoproteins and proteins which give those specific uh, shape of antigens on the surface of the cell. Then question 15, the following are all processes by which substances can enter a cell, endocytosis, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. Which processes are passive? You know endocytosis requires energy. So we have to, that is an active process. You know active transport, endocytosis, uh, and then phagocytosis and pinocytosis and exocytosis are all active processes. This was a very simple, straightforward question. Which processes are passive? You know, diffusion is passive, facilitated diffusion is also passive, and osmosis is also passive from a higher water potential to a lower water potential. So this is why it said passive. This is what you have to understand. The answer to this was C. Then we look at question 16. Equal volumes of five concentrations of sodium chloride solution were placed into five containers. 
An identical piece of plant tissue is placed into each container and left for 48 hours. The plant tissues were removed. Volumes of the sodium chloride solution were accurately measured. The results are shown below. Concentration of sodium chloride is on the x-axis in mole dm cube and the change in volume is on the y-axis. So which statement explains the result from 0 0.8? From 0 0.8 to 1 mole dm cube solution sodium dm cube sodium chloride. Explain the results. Which statements explain the results from 0 0.8 to here? So look at it here, it's become constant. The change in volume is no longer, the change in volume of the solution is no longer occurring. So if you look at it, there was no net movement of water into or out of the plant tissues. The plant root tissue had a water potential of zero. The plant tissues were fully plasmolized. Now, why, why three? Why you've got to understand is why three only? The plant tissues are fully plasmolized. So that means now no more change in the volume is taking place. You see, why did I circle this 0 0.20? You've got to understand it wherever this crosses, wherever this graph crosses. So this was the value which was the same water potential inside. Because after that, what you have said, you see there was a loss in uh, change in volume was a negative. And then there's a positive. So the point where the zero line is crossed by the graph is the point which is the same concentration of the cell sap or the cell cytoplasm which is, you see, of course, as you've increased the concentration of the sodium chloride, now if it was 0.2, then 0.4, then 0.6, and then as you can see, what would have happened, that if it was 0 0.2, 2, 1, or 2, 2, uh, then of course, you, if, as you increase it to 1, then what is going to happen is that the water from inside is going to uh, move out, and the cell is going to become plasmolized, because we had used, what had we used? We had used in five ident identical pieces of plant tissue. So we have to talk of plasmolysis here. So please understand that, please understand where it cuts the graph. This was the value of the concentration of the cell sap. And as you're increasing the concentration, plasmolysis would occur. Question 17, chromosome telomeres are essential for DNA replication and are not and I'm not sorry, I'm, the way I'm saying it, it looks makes me look a little ancient. Are not completely replaced during mitosis. Substance X completely replaces telomere during mitosis. What will be the effect of growing cells with and and without substance X? Now the answer to that is A. With substance X, of course, cells divide continuously and continually and without substance X, cell division eventually slows and stops because the telomeres would, of course, uh, be lost and that of course would result in uh, the answer which is cell division eventually slows and stops. The others are all incorrect. Uh, we can figure it out why they are incorrect. So as you look at question 18, gene mutations in either the BRCA1 or the BRCA2 genes are responsible for the majority of hereditary breast cancers in humans. Now the proteins produced by the two genes migrate to the nucleus where they interact with other proteins, such as those produced by the tumor suppressor gene, P53, and the DNA repair gene, RAD51, RAD51. Which combination of gene activity is most likely to result in breast, breast cancer? Number one, gene produces normal protein. Now, if the normal protein is made, there's not going to be any malignancy or there's not going to be any cancer. And the gene produces abnormal protein. Look what I have uh, out, uh, circled, you know, sort of, so either an abnormal protein or no protein. Now, naturally, if all of them are no protein or abnormal protein, and that line is correct, that would result in uh, cancer in humans. So question 18, then question 19. It says the information describes some events of mitosis. Chromosomes undergo condensation and spiralization. Centromeres are pulled by shortening of spindle fibers. Cystochromatids are oriented across the center of the cell. Centrioles separate from each other, spindle fibers disperse. 
which row correctly identifies the stages of mitosis in which these cells occur. So now I have sort of circled everything which is very important. Chromosomes undergo condensation. That's all. So we've got to understand is where is where is this coming from? So if you look at it, condensation and spiralization, that was the key to it. That condensation means that they condense and they become shorter and thicker. I mean, I don't like the word condensation, but they become shorter and thicker. So one had to be prophase. Then you have to understand is three center of the cell. We don't even say center, we say um, the equator. So the center of the cell, then centriole separate from me. So all of these would of course result in the answer was B, which is one was prophase. And of course, two was anaphase. Centromeres are pulled by shortening of the spindle fibers. And then three was sister chromatids are oriented across the center. And four was uh, centrioles separate from each other. Centrioles, please do not conf confuse this with centromere and centrosome, which is around the centrioles. So, be very clear when you're talking about what is a centriole and what is a centromere. So please be very clear about that. And then of course we come to the last question, which is question 20. Which diagram shows a correct ring structure and named nucleic acid base? So, I mean, how was I going to figure this out? Well, of course, if you, if you knew what were purines and pyrimidines, you know purines have the very simple way I remember it like this is adenine and guanine are purines. And this is the U in it. So I made a mnemonic for it is AUG. So adenine and guanine. So it says, and, they, and these of course also, purines also have a double ring. So there's a U and double as well. So double ring. So this is what you have to understand that the double ring could only be adenine and guanine. Now this double ring is uracil and this double ring is cytosine. And then you know adenine is a double ring. So this is what you have to remember in this and this is how they were going to test whether you knew this or not. So adenine and guanine are purines and they are double ring. So only C was correct because what is left out of all these? Adenine and if adenine and guanine are purines, then what is left? We've got cytosine, uracil and thymine. And these are now, of course, what? These are pyrimidines. So CUT is pyrimidines and these are single ring. So what you have to understand was thymine was the only correct answer, but only if you knew this, only if you remembered this, this is now of course rote learning. This is all rata. Adenine and guanine is double ring, purines. The rest three, cytosine, uracil and thymine are pyrimidines. Now I would like you to just look at these diagrams, which I have of course now given it to you in a uh, the ones which of course address the question. So question three, this is what I want you to look at. So please pause the video here. Then we look at question eight. This was what I want you to look at. This is the um, diagram which I want you to really clearly understand and how you've got to figure this out, the cellulose molecule. And question 13, which had this diagram. I want you to look at this and I want you to be very clear how the half Vmax, how the Vmax changes, how the half Vmax changes is given it to you in three colors and you need to figure this out, how the Vmax will change or will not change. This of the questions we've done in the second video and please uh, watch that as well so that you can complete this paper and thank you very much and best of luck for your exams.